Oh no, there goes the ball. Hi y'all. Welcome back to the channel. I'm making the video today about the solar shed. So, let's get started. This is my concrete rainwater tank. It's supplied my domestic water supply for the last oh, 17, 18 years. And on top of it, about six years ago, I added 12 kW of grid tied PV. And it's served really well. The uh, rainwater tank collects the water off of that roof over there and supplies the domestic water needs for us without fail. It uh, was originally built out of, uh, we, we basically formed up very easily, formed up some plywood forms to shoot the shell of a swimming pool. And that shell then had a rebar coming out of the top of it. And we poured a six and a half inch thick concrete top on top of it with a couple of uh, concrete columns inside and we left a three foot by three foot access hole in the top and then we took all the concrete forms from inside from forming up that lid out through that access hole and that 17 years ago cost eight thousand dollars and that holds 24,000 gallons of water usable about 22,000 gallons because you can't really use the last little bit and we uh, have been very happy with it ever since. These are the overflow pipes here, and those will get extended down so we don't get a lot of splash on this new building. Well, looks like Rona figured out how to get that ball back up the wall. She's pretty talented, and she loves this ball. But I'm going to take this ball away from her because... Rona gets really excited and starts to get real squeaky and you won't be able to hear me talk about this solar shed. All right, so this is the this is the building I am building to house oh you're excited aren't you? To house my new inverters. Put that out of the way for a little while. My new inverters and my batteries. And the inverters will hang on this wall. There'll be three 8KW inverters and one, the big uh, battery combiner box that you've seen in another video will mount on this wall. And the big batteries that I'm building that you've seen on the other videos, there'll be eight of them on the floor here, six or seven along this wall and a couple out front and they're all on wheels to uh, roll along. There's conduits that coming up into this building that go out to the power pole and also run over to other parts of this building so that I don't have quite as much exposed wire on the walls. These are the two existing grit tied um, inverters that will AC couple with the new hybrid inverters. And this is the concrete wall of the rainwater tank. On the other side of that is water and um, that gives a lot of thermal mass to help moderate the temperatures. With good insulation on these walls and roof, uh, I should be able to moderate the temperatures without the need for climate control most of the year. And in the more extreme parts of the year, I'm planning a ductless mini split. There'll be a ductless mini split head up here high on this wall. And the uh, condensing unit for that will be up on top of the rainwater tank. I'll show you where in just a second. Now, originally I was planning on an R30 bat insulation of fiberglass, which I'm really not fond of, but I then decided that this, uh, this roofing material that I used is two by six tongue and groove pine. And if I just put the insulation on top of the roof, I can leave this exposed inside and then I don't have to do any finish work and I don't have to put fiberglass in overhead. And so I'm gonna do that because in reality, that's how I build all of my buildings. 
this was going to be a a standout down to another ball this is going to be a standout because i don't usually put insulation inside the walls or inside the the attic of my buildings this is two inch polyisocyanurate foam sheeting and that will be put in two layers up on the roof of this building and will provide all of the insulation that's needed uh, to insulate this roof. I will then put a second layer of, of uh, sheathing on top of it with long screws that go down into that pine uh, roof that you've seen. And then I'll put my roofing material on top of that. And the reason I use this pine, well, two reasons, I guess, this was leftover scrap material from a project 15 years ago, and this was the reject boards that were too crooked and nasty for the framers to use. So they went home and been stored in my garage ever since. Uh, it was a custom mill and not able to be returned. And so this nastiness is what I used to build this roof. And the reason I did so is because this stuff will span on its own from support member to support member, about eight to 10 feet. And so I decided that I could just use it to support, uh, cantilevered out on its own, I could use it to support a four foot porch roof without any need for columns or bracketing back to the building. I'll take that foam insulation and put on top of the roof, but I will stop that right at this wall line so you'll only have a thin layer coming out. I think it'll look kind of nice for the porch. And then it will jump up with the thickness of the roof and extend on out. And I've got a small overhang in the front here. I'm sorry, on this high side, I've got a small overhang also, which will help keep water off of the tie-in. The biggest challenge to this building, in my opinion, is keeping water out of it where the connection is made with this concrete tank. The dissimilar materials and the, and the add-on uh, nature of this makes it very difficult to keep the water out. And in building these buildings, I have a list of priorities. And the number one priority in building any building is durability. And the number one enemy to durability is water. So managing your water in all its forms is the most important thing. On most of my buildings, I will cover the entire outside of the building with a peel and stick membrane. In this case, it's foil faced, but I typically use that only in some areas. Mostly I use a membrane that's designed for basement waterproofing and then protect it from the elements by putting all of the insulation on the outside of the building. I'll put two inches of that polyisocyanurate foam on the outside of the building and nothing inside the walls. And you think that might not be enough insulation, but the performance I get out of these buildings is astounding. The air tightness is absolute. Um, in this case, I am trying to get it airtight and watertight, but the way I did that, where I'm trying to tie into this concrete, is I put this membrane onto the building. I ran it off over onto the concrete. I cut back the plastering here with a grinder and sealed it to this, and it stuck. I used a little heat gun and just kind of melted it into that concrete. And then to protect the edge of the membrane from delamination from the concrete, I use a product that's a, a mastic that is designed for this membrane, and it I have never had it fail. Um, I have never had it come loose. And so I'm counting on that here, but then I am also going to extend the finished materials out past so that very little incidental water will ever even get to this seam. So multiple layers of protection, belt, suspenders, elastic waistband, whatever it takes to permanently protect the building from air leakage, and water intrusion. The the second most important thing in a building, typically a residential building, is indoor air quality. 
A lot of buildings get torn down because of bad indoor air quality, and the way you manage indoor air quality is you manage the air. You build an airtight building, and then you control the air that's inside that building, how it's brought in at what rates, how it's dehumidified, and how, the maintain, how you maintain the moisture levels of it. And then you're actually able to control the indoor environment for people. And the buildings we build, uh, people think that they want to open their windows but in our climate, that's not, there aren't a lot of great days to do that. Today is actually one of those days when you might want to open the windows. It's nice and cool. The air is dry and we don't have a lot of pollen and dust and smoke from burning off the fields in Mexico and all the other things that impact our indoor air quality here in uh, Texas. But that's not common. And what we do is we build an airtight, indoor air quality managed building that once people start to live in it, they find they never open their windows because the indoor air in their building is so superior to what they're used to that they never even, she's pretty good at playing with herself, that they never even uh, feel the need to open the windows for fresh air because the fresh air is already inside the building. All right. Uh, this little uh, bump up in the, little well, aside, this little bump up here is where the water comes in through a six inch pipe coming from the house over there. And it goes into a filter box up there. And someday I'm gonna do some more in-depth videos about this rainwater collection system. And I'll show you all that at that time. All right, I will be extending the solar array. The solar array on this house is adequate to make this building net zero, this, uh, the home net zero annually. But that doesn't mean that it will produce enough electricity during difficult times, cloudy weather, cold, rainy weather, to get me through with the number, even the large number of batteries I'm gonna have. So we, in a net zero off-grid house, where you're not trying to limit your usage to only uh, critical loads, you're going to have to be overproducing most of the year. And so in order to do that, I'm going to add about 60% more capacity to this system. And in order to do that, I'm going to take these steel purlins and I'm going to extend them on down this slope. This slope of soil here I brought in from uh, excavated material from projects and stacked up against the rainwater tank to help keep the, the tank cool in the summertime. And the slope is pretty similar to the slope of the solar array, so I'll just be extending that solar array down two more rows of solar panels. These uh, six-year-old solar panels average about 250 watts. I think I've got 245 watt and 255 watt panels here, a mixture of panels because I was just using cast off panels at the time to try to save money. And this time I'm gonna use similar panels, maybe slightly uh, higher wattage to increase the capacity of the system from 50 to 60% greater than it is now. And that will um, get me through those trying times. I'll bring those panels on down here. I'll drill down into the ground here and pour some concrete footings to mount the top of the new steel support members. And if I'm just trying to find 250, 280 watt panels instead of the 400 watt panels that are available now, I'll be able to just find used panels that maybe came off of a a hail damaged roof or something where the panels were fine, but the roof got damaged and the people wanted, uh, because they were limited to the amount of surface area that they had, not a concern we have here, uh, they wanted to upgrade their system. A lot of times they take off 265 watt panels and put 400 watt panels back and the 265 watt panels, they're just building up. Uh, you can find these used panels for very, uh, cheap or next to nothing prices and that's what I plan to do here to try to minimize the cost 
And um, in the next video about this panel, you're, about this building, you're going to see that I'm going to cover the south facing wall and west facing wall, the short wall up on top with this corrugated metal, which is very similar to the barn metal that we use on all of our exterior buildings here in Hill Country. And then on the north facing and east facing walls, I've got some more wasted cast off material, extra material that was left over from a project years ago and has been stored up on a shelf in my garage. It's just some old vinyl siding that's kind of a green color, make it blend in rather nicely. That change will happen at this corner. So when you come down, when you when you look at it from the rest of the property, it'll just be a, a nice dark green color that blends in with the trees. And the benefit of that vinyl siding, besides the fact that it was free, is that it has a foam backing to it that gives it another R3 uh, of insulative value. And so that R3 and this DuPont's half inch foam, which is an R3, is going to put an R6 on the outside of the building on the north wall and east wall, and it'll have an R13 of fiberglass on the inside. And so that's going to be quite a good uh, R value for this climate. And I don't think that we're going to use a lot of energy trying to climate control this building. And I won't try to keep it to the temperature that I have the inside of the house, but I'll probably manage the temperatures in a range of something like 85, 90 degrees at the high end and maybe 55 degrees at the low end. It won't take much energy at all to accomplish that, but it will make the inverters and the batteries much more efficient and that efficiency will probably uh, pay for the energy that it takes to climate control the building. And as I test it, I may set those parameters tighter and make it even uh, more pleasant inside the building. Uh, because if it saves enough on efficiencies to pay for the energy, then there's no reason not to do that and help uh, lengthen the lifespan of the inverters. And I know these inverters that have been out in the sun for six years, they're going to like their new home and they're going to, the inverters are going to create a lot of heat in here. So there'll be more air conditioning energy needed than heating energy. I'm sure I may not need heating energy typically at all uh, in a building like this. It may be that I'm actually air conditioning the building even in the winter time which will be a pretty easy task for a ductless mini split to do when it's trying to air condition a building with cool air from outside. All right, I think that's gonna do it for this video. There's uh, a lot more to come. I appreciate you staying with me. Please subscribe if you haven't already. There's so much coming up. And I do intend to make a lot of videos in the future after this project is over. This channel is going to switch to uh, or shift over to something I have a lot more expertise with. And that is building high performance buildings with, ex with superior indoor air quality, durability, and uh, energy efficiency. And they're pretty beautiful to look at as well. So I'd like to share all that with you in future videos. Go ahead and subscribe and, you know, click on that little bell thing so you get notifications. I want to go ahead and get this channel uh, to grow some more so that we can get this information out to more people that need it. And uh, I think that's it for this video. And I'll see you on the next one. I wonder what... Oh, now Rona. Wow, man. Rona must have found her a bird. <laughs> I was wondering where she ran off to. She gets so excited with these buzzards that fly overhead, and she chases buzzards back and forth at breakneck speed. I think she just wants to fly. 
Y'all have a good one. That's it for this one.